Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we're heading into the final leg of our four-day conference, and I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Khalil Ganim, who's from the Johns Hopkins University uh, in Baltimore, a colleague of Dr. Cheever, as you just heard. And there's a lot new in STI treatment with the guidelines just coming out, and uh, he's going to focus on that for us, and I don't want to take any more time, so I'm going to turn it right over to him. Uh, Dr. Ganim, please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Sag. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, I hope you can all see my slides now. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for joining me. Um, I'm going to go through these slides quickly because I have 25 minutes to tell you all about the changes in the 2021 SDI treatment guidelines that just came out from the CDC. But I promise if you still have any questions, join me for the breakout session this afternoon, and we will talk about any question you might have about any STI that you want. I know it's called syphilis, but we'll cover all STIs, and I have cases in case you don't have any questions. So thanks again, and I have no relevant financial relationships, and we're going to review the STI treatment guidelines. So I'm going to start with gonorrhea, ladies and gentlemen, and it's big changes to gonorrhea. Remember now that gonorrhea, the treatment is 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone. And if chlamydia is present or is not ruled out, you have to add one week of oral doxycycline taken twice daily. If you rule out chlamydia with a nucleic acid amplification test, you don't have to give, you don't have to give doxycycline. You can just treat with uh, intramuscular ceftriaxone. Now, if the patient has uh, rectal or urogenital gonorrhea, you have other options. The alternate options for those sites are 800 milligrams of, uh, of um, sufficient theme, and it's no longer 400 milligrams, but 800 milligrams. Or if they have an uh, allergy to cephalosporins, you have the option of using genomycin plus two grams of oral azithromycin. Those are your options, alternate options for urogenital and rectal. For pharyngeal infections with gonorrhea, you have no other options. You have to use ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams uh, IM. Um, and also for all persons with pharyngeal gonorrhea, you need to do a test of cure one to two weeks later. I suggest if you can wait two weeks because the rate of false positivity is lower. So remember, you always have to do a test of cure and your only option is uh, ceftriaxone to treat pharyngeal infections. So as a result, a reported history of penicillin allergy should prompt you to obtain more information. The vast majority of people who tell you I have a penicillin allergy can be safely treated with ceftriaxone. 90 plus percent who tell you I have a penicillin allergy, you can safely treat them with ceftriaxone. And I'll show you a bit of data in just a bit. Also remember that you want to bring everybody with gonorrhea and chlamydia and syphilis and trichomoniasis and mycoplasma, you want to bring them back in three months after you treat them to rescreen them because reinfection rates are so high. And then you want to treat all sex partners uh, for all of these conditions uh, in the preceding 60 days, uh, and you want to treat them for whatever infection you just treated the index patient for. In this case, you want to treat them for gonorrhea. Now, uh, keep in mind disseminated gonococcal infection, and disseminated gonococcal infection is making a comeback in the United States. Remember that the strains of gonorrhea that cause disseminated gonococcal infection will cause minimal inflammation. So most patients will not have a genital discharge or any symptoms. And that's why it's really important to go after all the mucosal sites by testing. And so what you want to do is you want to send nucleic acid amplification tests and cultures from uh, the urogenital sites, from the throat, and from the rectum. The reason why you're getting cultures is because you're going to need susceptibility testing, antimicrobial susceptibility testing. It's going to be really important. And then the reason why you're doing NATS is because NATS are more sensitive than culture at all mucosal sites. And then usually the treatment, you start with IV ceftriaxone. And then as long as they don't have endocarditis or septic arthritis, you can quickly, once the patients start doing better, you can switch them over to an oral uh, regimen based on the susceptibility patterns that you get from gonorrhea. So don't forget disseminated gonococcal infection. Don't miss it. If you don't, if you don't diagnose it, there's a high risk of, um, uh, of mortality. Uh, also remember that certain complement inhibitors like eculizumab 
put people at risk for these infections. So if you have somebody on eculizumab, uh, keep in mind the possibility of nicereal infections, including disseminated gonococcal infection. So what do you do if a patient reports a penicillin allergy? The first thing you do is don't abandon ceftriaxone just yet. You need to get more information about the penicillin allergy because ceftriaxone is so critical for the treatment of gonorrhea, and it's so critical for the treatment of pelvic inflammatory disease. And so you need to learn more about the penicillin allergy. I want you to keep in mind that individuals, even individuals who have a documented IgE-mediated allergy, anaphylaxis, um, et cetera, after 10 years and 80% of these individuals, they will have lost the sensitivity after 10 years. Uh, and so even individuals who are known to have IgE-mediated allergies, they will have lost it in, in 10 years. So it's really important to get a good history. If somebody tells you, you know, I've had a reaction to ceftriaxone, or they say, I've had a reaction to penicillin, five years ago, and I couldn't breathe, and they took me to the emergency room, fine. Those patients, you don't necessarily have to give ceftriaxone. But the majority of patients who report a penicillin allergy will usually tell you, I don't remember what the allergy caused because I was a child and my mom told me that I had an allergy. In those cases, take your ceftriaxone and give it. The likelihood that you're going to encounter a problem is essentially nil. Uh, and so keep in mind, if somebody says penicillin allergy and you're dealing with gonorrhea, first and foremost, and the same thing applies to syphilis as well, first and foremost, ask more questions. And unless they give you a clear history of anaphylaxis or severe reaction in the preceding 10 years, the likelihood that they're going to have a problem when you give them ceftriaxone is essentially nil. Now, we'll talk about chlamydia. And chlamydia, there have been changes as well. The first change is that now doxycycline is the preferred regimen or agent to treat chlamydia trachomatis. And there was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine for urogenital um, chlamydia, and it found that doxycycline uh, as compared to azithromycin was 3% more effective. So not that much difference between doxy and azithro for urogenital. But for rectal infections, a huge difference. 20% efficacy difference favoring doxycycline. So doxycycline is much better at treating rectal chlamydia than is azithromycin. And so if you're dealing with rectal chlamydia, and if you're dealing with chlamydia in general, and there's no contraindication to using doxycycline, go ahead and use doxycycline. Now, if you're worried about a patient that may not adhere to the regimen, then in that case, it's okay to use azithromycin. But unless there's a contraindication or an issue with adherence, the recommendation for chlamydia is to use doxycycline instead of azithromycin because it seems to work better, particularly for rectal infections. Now, I just want to remind you of a couple of things with testing. Remember that when you're using nucleic acid amplification tests, you can use any kind of specimen. You can use a self-collected vaginal swab, urethral swab, urine, um, the liquid path. You have a lot of options when you're using NATS. But if you're getting GC culture, for GC culture, urogenital, you have to get an endocervical swab in women, and you have to get a urethral swab in men. A vaginal swab or urine is not appropriate for gonorrhea culture. Uh, you can certainly do culture at the throat and at the rectum, but remember that as compared to nucleic acid amplification tests at the throat and rectum, uh, it is culture is only about 50% sensitive, 5-0. So it's not very sensitive, but it's useful if you're looking for antimicrobial susceptibility uh, results. And then, so that's something very important culture. You can't do it on every single specimen. It has to be either a, an endocervical swab or a, a urethral swab. Uh, remember uh, uh, the extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia. It's very important to test extragenital for extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia. 
particularly in MSM. So in MSM, you want to test and screen at all sites of exposure. But the CDC treatment guidelines in 2021 say that with women, it should be shared clinical decision making. So you should talk to your uh, to your patient um, and uh, essentially d- determine if they've had exposures. And if they've had exposures, whether um, uh, whether wh- whomever they are, you should probably consider screening at the throat and at the rectum. So uh, the formal screening recommendations are for MSM, but keep in mind that for other populations, shared decision making is very uh, is quite quite appropriate. I want to remind you a few things about proctitis. First of all, proctitis, the symptoms are anorectal pain, tenesmus, and rectal discharge. Proctocolitis has some of these same symptoms plus diarrhea, abdominal cramps, etc. And the causes of proctitis tend to be uh, sexually transmitted infections, gonorrhea, chlamydia, LGV, syphilis, and herpes. Proctocolitis, on the other hand, it can be a sexually transmitted infection like LGV, but it can also be um, uh, other not traditional sexually transmitted infections, which can be sexually transmitted, such as Campylobacter, Entamoeba, Shigella, etc. Uh, and keep Keep in mind that initial testing for proctitis, you can do nucleic acid amplification testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia, syphilis serologies, and HSV nucleic acid amplification test. That's the appropriate workup for proctitis or proctocolitis. Now, lymphogranuloma venarium, I know you all know about it. It's caused by chlamydia trachomatis, but the serovarves that cause more um, that are more aggressive. And the main difference, when you do a nucleic acid amplification test for chlamydia, it comes back positive for either the LGV sero- serovars or for the traditional serovars. It will not distinguish between the two. So when you get one that comes back positive, you don't know whether it's LGV or whether it's the typical D through K serotypes. Why is it important to know whether it's LGV? Because if the patient is symptomatic and they have uh, LGV, you need to treat them with three weeks of doxycycline instead of one week of doxycycline. Uh, and so the treatment differs uh, in individuals between those who have the LGV serovars and the non-LGV serovars. Uh, unfortunately, there is currently no commercially available way to distinguish between the LGV serovars and the non-LGV chlamydia trachomatis serovars. So what are you supposed to do when you have a patient? Well, send a nucleic acid amplification test for chlamydia trachomatis. And if it comes back, don't worry about it. Based on symptoms, decide how long to treat. So if a patient has moderate to severe symptoms, give them three weeks of doxycycline. If they have no symptoms or very mild symptoms, give them one week of doxycycline. That's the easiest approach. Go by symptoms. So if you have a positive rectal nucleic acid amplification test for chlamydia trachomatis, treat them based on symptoms. Pelvic inflammatory disease is actually has not not had significant changes other than now the recommendation to treat pelvic inflammatory disease is to add metronidazole to the cephalosporin plus doxycycline regimen. Remember that 90% of uh, patients with PID can be treated uh, in the outpatient setting. You don't have to admit them to the hospital for uh, PID treatment, including persons with a- living with HIV. And so uh, it's important that you are able to use outpatient treatment. The most common one is ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams, IM, followed by doxy and metronidazole for two weeks. Unfortunately, all outpatient treatment regimens for PID are cephalosporin-based. So if you have somebody who has a real reaction to cephalosporins, your only recommended options are to use parenteral regimen. So you're going to have to admit them uh, to the hospital to treat them. That's why it's also really important when somebody tells you they have a penicillin allergy to stop and ask more questions. 
Urethritis is, uh, also has changed uh, significantly. Uh, and I want to remind you with urethritis about uh, two things. The first uh, is that most patients who come in with urethritis, you're going to be looking for gonorrhea and chlamydia initially. And you're going to treat them empirically for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, and you're going to see what happens. If the patients essentially get better, great. You don't have to worry about it. If the patients don't get better, then the next step is to test for other pathogens. If that patient is uh, MSM, then you should be testing and they have persistent symptomatic urethritis despite treatment for gonorrhea and chlamydia and with negative nucleic acid amplification tests for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Then you should test them for mycoplasma genitalium. For MSWs, men who have sex with women, if they have persistent symptoms despite treatment, then you should test them for both trichomonas and mycoplasma genitalia. We don't usually test MSM for, for trichomonas because it's not prevalent in the MSM population. It tends to be much more prevalent in the MSW population. So test for mycoplasma genitalia, in men who have persistent symptoms of urethritis, also test MSW for trichomonas. And then based on the results, you can treat the patient. So mycoplasma genitalium now has changed. The therapeutic approach has changed in the 2021 treatment guidelines. A few things to remember with MGEN. The first thing is don't screen anyone for MGEN. In other words, if the patients don't have symptoms, don't test for mycoplasma genitalium. Only men who have persistent urethritis and consider in women who have persistent cervicitis. Otherwise, don't test for mycoplasma genitalium. But if you have uh, uh, persons with persistent urethritis and persons with persistent cervicitis, go ahead and test for mycoplasma genitalium. If it comes back reactive, then uh, you need to treat them. Uh, most uh, situations in the United States, most settings in the United States will not have access to um, macrolide resistance testing for microplasma genitalium. If you don't have access to that, most of us don't have access, then the way you treat mycoplasma is one week of doxy followed by one week of moxifloxacin. So moxifloxacin, uh, which for a week, 400 milligrams. So you start with doxy. Doxy alone doesn't cure but it decreases the bacterial load. And then you follow it up with a week of moxie, which will cure uh, most of these patients. Uh, if you happen to be in a location where you have access to macrolide resistance, so the diagnostic test will tell you, yes, it's positive for mycoplasma genitalium, and yes, it is sensitive to macrolides. Then you can start with doxy for a week and then follow it up with uh, azithromycin, and azithromycin uh, is uh, essentially given one gram uh, initially, followed by 500 milligrams on days two, three, and four. So it's a total of 2.5 uh, grams over four days. You see, mycoplasma genitalium is complicated. Uh, and so remember, you only want to test individuals with persistent cervicitis and persistent urethritis. Now, syphilis serologies are always confusing, and you have to remember a few things about syphilis serologies, and you'll be able to interpret any diagnostic test. Remember with the RPR and VDRL that they're going to be non-reactive in 30% of persons with primary syphilis. Remember that uh, you're going to get false positives with the RPR and VDRL, and there are many causes that I've listed here. And then remember with the RPR and the VDRL that they may become non-reactive over time, either with treatment or even in patients that are not treated. So that's the big difference between the RPR, VDRL, the non-treponemal tests, and the treponemal tests. The non-treponemal tests over time may become non-reactive with or without treatment. And then the treponemal tests will always be reactive whether you treated the patient or not. That's the main difference between the non-treponemal and the treponemal test. If you know these rules on the left, you will be able to interpret every single permutation of uh, a syphilis diagnostic testing, whether you're using a traditional algorithm 
or a reverse sequence algorithm. And we talk, we can talk more about that in the afternoon if you'd like. Now, the big question that always comes up with our patients is what do you do with an RPR titer that doesn't respond appropriately? So you treat the patient and then you follow their RPR titers every three months. And then the first thing that you have to do is for early syphilis, primary, secondary, and early latent, you have to wait a full year for the RPR titer to decline fourfold. For those with late latent syphilis, you have to wait two years for their RPR titers to decline fourfold. So uh, as a first rule, wait for those titers to come down. You should not be in a hurry to retreat the patient. Of course, if at one year or two years, the RPR titers have not come down, what should you do? First, figure out if the patient has any neurological signs or symptoms. If they do, then you should do a lumbar puncture. Uh, could the patient have been reinfected? If they could have been reinfected, then go ahead and treat them. And then if they don't have any neurological signs or symptoms and they were not reinfected and you waited for 12 months or 24 months, what should you do if their titers haven't come down? Well, you have two options, either retreat them or just watch and wait. And there have been four observational studies that have shown that it makes no difference whether you watch or wait or retreat them. And so for most patients, it's okay to just follow them, continue to follow them without retreating them, assuming they don't have any neurological signs or symptoms or they've not been reinfected. A patient whose titers go up fourfold, that's a different story. You have to figure out if they got reinfected. If they got reinfected, go ahead and retreat them. But if they deny any exposures, in that situation, you should consider a lumbar puncture because it could be a manifestation of asymptomatic neurosyphilis. So it's two different things. If the titers don't go down fourfold versus if the titers go up fourfold. And now you know what to do with either situation. Who should get a lumbar puncture? Persons who have neurological signs and symptoms, persons who are diagnosed with cardiovascular or gummatous tertiary syphilis, because 30% of those will have asymptomatic neurosyphilis. And then you should consider an individuals whose titers go up fourfold, uh, and you've ruled out the possibility of reinfection, as we talked about on the previous slide. There are no data to support routine lumbar puncture in asymptomatic persons who are living with HIV. And so if you want to do a lumbar puncture in, uh, in a person living with HIV whose CD4 count is less than 350 or whose RPR titer is greater than 1 to 32, that's okay. You can go ahead and do that. But there are no data to support it. And so there are no recommendations to do it. I don't personally do it. I don't do uh, lumbar punctures routinely on persons with HIV unless they fall into the categories that we discussed above. Also, another change in um, the treatment guidelines, if you diagnose somebody with neurosyphilis today uh, you, and you treat them, you don't have to do a follow-up CSF examination at six months if, they're clinical, uh, if, they're, if they clinically are doing better and their RPR titers are declining appropriately. So, excuse me, if the patient that you treat today with neurosyphilis clinically gets better, and their RPR titers decline appropriately, you do not have to do a follow-up CSF examination, assuming that they're on effective antiretroviral therapy. If they're not on antiretroviral therapy, you still have to do a CSF examination in six months following treatment of neurosyphilis to make sure that their CSF parameters are decreasing. So as long as they're on effective antiretroviral therapy, you don't have to do anything. Keep in mind otosyphilis and ocular syphilis. For otosyphilis and ocular syphilis, you do not have to do a lumbar puncture because 40% of persons with ocular syphilis and 90% of persons with otosyphilis will have a normal CSF examination. And so if you, only, if you have a person with only ocular symptoms or only otic symptoms, do not do a lumbar puncture, just go ahead and treat them with 10 to 14 days of IV penicillin. Only persons with neurological signs or symptoms should you do a lumbar puncture, and we can talk about that some more in our afternoon session. With pregnancy, remember 
the goal is to use penicillin. There's no other option to use, um, no other option to use for, uh, uh, for persons who are pregnant. And then, uh, in between doses in pregnancy, you can go up to nine days, uh, between benzathine penicillin G doses. For non-pregnant adults, you can go up to 10 days in between doses. So nine days uh, for pregnant adults and 10 days for non-pregnant adults. Finally, serological testing for herpes is a big mess. And I want to remind you, unfortunately, we don't have great serological tests. The, uh, the NATS, nucleic acid amplification tests for herpes, when somebody has a lesion are fantastic. But when somebody doesn't have a lesion, you, you can only do a serological test. You, most serological tests are EIAs, they're ba- EIA based, but some are CIAs. It doesn't matter. If you do a serological test and the EIA or CIA value is less than three, you now have to do a second confirmatory test, either the Western blot or the BioKid rapid test. You must do a second confirmatory test if the index value is less than three, because when the index value is less than three, the rate of false positives increases significantly. And so keep in mind now, if you're testing for HSV2 using serologies, and the serological EIA index value is less than three, you have to obtain another test to confirm the first test. Unfortunately, serological testing for HSV is still not perfect, and we're not there yet. Never try to order or interpret IgM serologies. They do not tell you anything about um, whether this uh, infection is recent. A lot of people who have long-standing herpes have uh, IgM serologies. Just two things with uh, herpes. If you have a person with HIV and a CD4 count less than 200, and they have a history of symptomatic genital herpes, when you start them on ART, also put them on suppressive therapy for herpes for six months to decrease the risk of reactivation. And then during pregnancy, if you have a person who's pregnant, who's about to deliver, in the past, we used to say if they have lesions at the time of delivery, you should do a C-section. Now we say if they have lesions at the time of delivery or prodromal symptoms, they don't necessarily have to have lesions, but they can have prodromal symptoms like itching, burning, etc. If they have prodromal symptoms, even without lesions, you should undergo, they should undergo a C-section. And then the last thing, this is old news, but uh, remember with trichomonas that if you have a, a, a patient um, that uh, is being is diagnosed with trichomonas vaginalis, uh, you should go ahead and treat them. If they have a, uh, if they have a, a, a uterus uh, or cervix, you should go ahead and treat them uh, with metronidazole for one week. Um, and uh, if they don't, then you can go ahead and treat them uh, with uh, two grams of metrodizol single dose. So um, uh, persons with a, uh, a vaginal or uh, with a vagina or cervix should be treated with one week of metronidazole. Uh, those that don't can be treated with two grams of metronidazole. Everybody can be treated with, uh, with um, tinidazole two grams. So you can treat anyone with tinidazole two grams, but if you're using metronidazole to treat somebody with trichomonas, uh, it really depends on um, uh, who you're treating. You either need to use one week or you can use two grams uh, if they don't have a vagina or cervix. Also remember that you're going to screen all your, uh, uh, all your um, uh, uh, patients with uh, a cervix and vagina. You're going to screen them annually for trichomoniasis. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I went over by two minutes, uh, but I appreciate your listening. And we can go over many of these issues in the afternoon session if you'd like to join me. Thanks so much. Fabulous. A um, lot of information. Uh, so I feel like we almost have to take a deep breath because that was um, very succinct, very uh, potent amount of new stuff. So lots of questions, as you can imagine, we'll use the time we have. And then, as you said, there's a breakout for folks who uh, want to go. So I'll go quick and hopefully get quick answers. Um, in that individual who has, as we say in the South, sure enough, anaphylaxis, to ceftriaxone when they got anal rectal GC, do you desensitize? What would you do? So if they have anal rectal or urogenital, you can use uh, the uh, regimen that's uh, gentamicin based plus uh, two grams of azithromycin. If they have pharyngeal, 
and they have a real reaction, then you're going to use uh, the regimen that's gentamicin-based and two grams of azithromycin, and you're going to do a test of cure. The reason why the CDC didn't give that option is because they want providers to think long and hard before using an alternate regimen for pharyngeal gonorrhea. Gentamicin yeah. is not a great drug for pharyngeal gonorrhea. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I haven't, I'm not sure I've ever seen a documented uh, or witnessed a anaphylactic reaction to ceftriaxone. I, I know they happen, but they're kind of uncommon. Um, and, and the reporting of allergies, as you indicated, are quite high. Um, yes. For test of cure for pharyngeal GC by nucleate, nucleic acid test, uh, possible false positive, um, and that require culture and sensitivity, um, are all the labs capable of doing susceptibility adequately? So not all the labs. The major, um, the major uh, commercial labs all can do gonorrhea culture and susceptibility testing. A lot of the smaller labs may not have that capacity. But if you happen to be at a location that doesn't have the capacity, the easiest thing to do is call your local health departments. A lot of local health departments are able to do gonorrhea testing. So, for example, in Maryland, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene will actually do gonorrhea testing for individuals that don't have access to commercial labs. So you can always get that test, whether through commercial labs or through your local health department. Great. John Weiser wants to know about someone who's uh, overweight, uh, more than 150 kilograms, has GC, is one gram of subtraxone sufficient? Yes. So if they're over 150 kilograms, you go from 500 milligrams to a gram. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Steve Leiner is asking about pregnancy and possible LGB. Can you use doxycycline uh, for in that setting? It's a short course. Uh, what do, what uh, do you think? No, I wouldn't. I would use azithromycin. In that case, I mean, if you look at the data for pregnancy and doxy through the FDA, really there are very limited concerns regarding that. But nobody wants to take any risks, right? And so we try to avoid all risks during pregnancy. And in that case, I think it's reasonable and it's okay to use azithromycin if you're using uh, treating LGV. You can use a gram weekly for three consecutive weeks if they have mild to moderate symptoms. Yeah, Harsha Tripathi wants to know about uh, neuro what you consider neurologic symptoms for syphilis. In other words, it gives you that green light. Uh, intermittent headache, I mean, it seems to me it's almost anything, right? Yeah. No, so I, I think what you're going to have to look for is, so headaches are the most common manifestation, but the way I phrase it is, are you having headaches that are different uh, than or more frequent than headaches that you've had in the past? If somebody says, I get headaches all the time. So uh, you're going to have to tease out by history whether you think that this is something new uh, or whether you think that this is something that has been ongoing for several years and has nothing to do with syphilis. So that's where I think the art of medicine uh, comes comes in. So just ask additional questions, figure out if they have any other symptoms, weakness, any cranial nerve abnormalities, um, all of those things, new onset seizures and no reason to have seizures, all of those things can be manifestations of syphilis, uh, but they can also be manifestations of other things. So you're going to have to try to tease out what's new and what's related with syphilis. Uh, there's no easy answer to that great question. We talk a lot about optic neuritis and other things uh, we need to be aware of and treat like neurosyphilis. Andrew, uh, Yurgao wants to know about testing for trick in men. Uh, her lab won't accept a male urine specimen for trick. Yeah. So the problem with testing for trick in men is that there are no FDA cleared NATs for testing uh, in men. That doesn't mean that labs don't test for uh, for trick, but they have to do in-house validation assays to be able to do that. All the commercial labs offer testing for men, and they do it usually with urine, uh, or you can also get a urethral swab to do it. It's easier to do it with urine. First catch urine. Remember, you're not doing a midstream urine. For all STI testing, you're doing a first catch urine, preferably if the patient hasn't gone to the bathroom for the previous two hours. Uh, so again, uh, you have to figure out which labs in your area are doing it, and then you can send it out. All the commercial labs actually do it for men. James Zachary has a good question about what to do with the uh, an MSM asymptomatic pyuria that's negative for GC and chlamydia. Um, 
we always talk to uh, sterile pyuria is is TB, but uh, what about um, mycoplasma in that setting? Yeah, in that setting, if you're working up somebody with sterile pyuria um, and you're thinking maybe, and they're asymptomatic, it's not unreasonable to test for mycoplasma genitalium because if it comes back positive, you might have an answer. You would treat them and then follow to see if the sterile pyuria uh, essentially um, dissipates. Uh, and so in that setting, I think it's not unreasonable to test somebody. But remember, they're, they have signs of urethritis, so it's okay to test. But individuals with no signs or symptoms don't test for mycoplasma genitalium. It just becomes a hassle if you have to figure out what to do next, et cetera. So only individuals with signs or symptoms. Yeah, and we just ran out of time uh, here. Uh, great questions in there. I don't know if you'll have a moment to go through and maybe answer yep. by typing in some answers. That'd be great. Thanks so much. A wonderful review. And uh, at this point, I'll turn the a podium over to Dr. Agwa, who will introduce our panel.